and welcome to Reflecting on His Word, a Bible study intended to help Christians deepen their walk with the Lord by deepening their understanding of Scripture. Well, hello everyone. Welcome from all across America and around the world. Welcome to Reflecting on His Word. We've been reflecting in the book of Romans currently. We're almost through with it. We're up to Romans chapter 14. So open your Bibles to Romans chapter 14 for the lesson I'm entitling, I'm okay, you're okay. You may recognize that as a title from a book on humanism from back in the early 70s. Maybe it was late 60s. Um, It all kind of runs together at this age. But I'm okay, you're okay. Uh, We're not going to be talking humanism here. Let's read together Romans chapter 14. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. For he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth thanks. Give God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and received, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know, and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus, that there is nothing unclean of itself, But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you have regarded us so highly as to give us your word and to sacrifice your son for us. Now, Lord, help us to be earnest about our desire to regard our brethren 
that you have cared so much for that we regard them just as highly to care about them more than we care about ourselves. Lord, help us to have this sort of selfless love for the brethren. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I'm okay, you're okay. And as I said, not in the humanist sense, but I like my titles to be thought-provoking and even enigmatic from time to time uh, so as to make us think outside the box or think just a little bit differently. If everything is predictable, we don't think much. When it's unpredictable, we do more thinking. Um, and that's my excuse for my silly titles and uh, some of my section headings. So there we have it. So I'm okay. You're okay. Let's talk about I'm okay. Um, verses 1 through 12, we'll talk about our individual responsibilities and then how that affects those around us, our brethren. And then I kind of added to it a little bit and made We're Okay the title for the last two verses. So let's talk about I'm okay. Him that is weak in the faith receiveth ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Now, there are some, and <laughs> it's hard for me not to wax uh, preachy and finger waggy here because um, there's much that afflicts the church in America today. Um, prosperity and ease uh, have taken their toll on the church, and we have become worldly and petty in many ways, and I don't consider myself exempt from that, but I fight against it, and we need to always fight against that. But one of the things that happens when we become worldly, when we to begin to care what men think of us, well, then we want to do some of the things they do and act like they do, and it has become very popular in the church in America today for folks to point to this very verse and say, oh, but doubtful disputations. Now, they say doubtful things. Um, you may find that in another translation, but it's the disputing that is doubtful. <laughs> um, but let's say, for instance, that the topic be doubtful, whether it be the topic or the dispute that be doubtful, this is often used incorrectly by many, and I don't even think that they necessarily mean well. They mean to be selfish. They want to qualify themselves. They want to qualify their beliefs and excuse licentious behavior, and we need to not be in the habit of doing that. We need to spend less time excusing ourselves and more time sacrificing for our Lord. These things, uh, living a holy life, living a life of sacrifice for the Lord has fallen into disrepute. We, we don't even think about these things anymore in the church. It sounds kind of crazy to some, I think, to be sacrificing oneself and to give up things for the Lord, to uh, prayer and fasting even have fallen into disrepute. You're kind of viewed as a nut if you talk about these things. You talk about sacrificial living and people will look at you funny. But we need not worry about what people think. We need to be ready to sacrifice. But there are those who will call things doubtful simply to excuse themselves. And the thrust of this passage, the thrust of this thought in Scripture is way different than they are treating it. And we'll see that here in a sec. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. We're talking about eating meat sacrificed to idols and the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter that some pagan uh, has attempted to dedicate a slab of meat to a pagan god. They are no god that are pagan gods. They are not god at all. It's just a demonic thought. The meat remains meat and is fit to eat. <laughs> all other things being equal, it still is fit for consumption. But there are those who would say, no, we can't do that. And... Those are the ones we need to be careful of that we not run roughshod over them. So some will meet, eat that meat and others will say, no, I'll just have the herbs. Thank you very much. Let not him that eat despise him that eats not. And let not him which eats not judge him that eats. For God hath received him. Um, neither place, neither 
point of view, neither uh, angle on this topic is superior to the other. These are simply believers falling in the different camps. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? Um, we don't get to decide who is doing right and who is doing wrong so much. Now, we're told in Scripture, we're urged to watch over one another, the brethren. We're to help one another and to encourage one another to good works and righteousness. But it's not our job, job to condemn. It's not our job to decide all things. We simply are urged in Scripture to judge one another so that we can help one another. Um, if I see my friend wobbling in his faith or straying off in sin, I need to judge this matter and go to him in love and attempt to bring him back to restore such a one. But we're being told here that who are you to judge an other man's servant? He's going to have to answer to his master, not to you. We are not everybody's daddy as much as I want to be everybody's daddy. I want everybody to come under my authority. Sometimes uh, the world is so crazy. I just want to take, you know, take the bull by the horns and be everybody's daddy, but that's not my job. Now it is my job to attempt to tell the truth, to rightly divide the word, to uh, exhort, reprove, commend, to uh, steer people in the right direction, to preach the gospel, to preach the truth. Uh, that men would be edified with that. Paul goes on to talk about esteeming one day above, above another. Um, I'm not sure whether he was speaking of the Sabbath versus the Lord's day. Sometimes we incorrectly refer to Sunday as the Sabbath. It is not. But Jesus said, uh, man is not for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. The Sabbath was a day of rest to honor God because God rested that day to reflect on what God has done in this world for us and in us and through us. Um, the Sabbath is for that. We don't worship on the Sabbath. And the first century church made a decision somewhere along the line. I'm not sure where it happened to worship and celebrate on the Lord's day. This is the day that the Lord rose from the grave. And you can see why they might have done that. Um, it's important for us not to regard a particular day but to have a day set aside for the Lord and not man for the Sabbath it not to be some rigorous thing as you might find in that uh, first century Judaism where there were thousands of laws hemming men in to make sure that they do not uh, work on the Sabbath. And uh, that was not our Lord's focus at all. It was to be focused on him and we should, uh, delay or, or put aside our toils to spend time contemplating what God has done for us, his love for us, to contemplate the holiness of our Lord and to pursue personal holiness. But these thousands of laws um, were incredibly binding and ended up making men slaves to the Sabbath rather than uh, uh, rejoicing in the Sabbath day. And of course there is rejoicing and worshiping on the Lord's day as well. But you know, to esteem one day above the other is not so important. Um, in our work a day world, there are people that work shift work. They work all kinds of hours and, and sometimes that cannot be helped. And you may have to work on Sunday and it'd be better if you didn't, if you can find a job where you can work Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday, that is better. Um, in my opinion, but, uh, you need to set aside some time. If you, uh, work, a shift or a schedule that has you working on Sunday on one of your days off. You need to set that time aside. You need to set time aside to contemplate what the Lord has done for you and to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ and to contemplate the scriptures. We need to do these things. We need to reflect and worship and spend time set aside away from the world to, to have a Sabbath rest as it were. But I think Paul's making it clear here that, that it's not the days that are so important, but that you do honor the Lord with a day. So regarding a day, if one guy regards this day, it's fine. That honors the Lord. If another guy requires uh, uh, honors this day, well, he too, um, having regarded that other day, also is honoring the Lord. So whether we eat the meat or eat the herbs or whether we adhere to a, uh, a Sabbath or the Lord's day, 
these things can still honor God. So he that eateth, eateth to the Lord, he that, uh, for he gives thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and gives God thanks. These things are important to, for us to understand that not we don't get wrapped up and in honoring one thing above another. So if we if we live, we live to the Lord. If we if we die, we die to the Lord. Whatever we do, we live or die. We are the Lord's, and we need to work according to our conscience. For to this end, Christ both died and rose, and received that He might be the Lord both of the dead and the living. So why do you judge your brother? Why would you? Um, Worry about it when he's going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Every soul will be judged and that everyone shall give account to himself, to God. Um, The lost and the saved will be at different judgments, but we all will be judged in a manner where we have to respond to our Lord. So armed with that knowledge, we should be able to give grace to our brethren and understand that some are loosed and some are bound. But if they serve the Lord, then so be it. And it's funny that even in Scripture itself, some things are loosed that had been bound and some things are bound that had been loosed. And it's important for us to, it's like a boxer keeps his feet moving so that he can move around and keep from getting punched hard so he can avoid his uh, adversary harming him, we too need to keep our feet moving. We need to be ready to shift and to change in accordance to how God reveals his will to us through his scripture. Because sometimes we're taken of a certain belief and then we get to reading scripture and we pursue personal holiness. We sacrifice our earthly desires to him and make our desires heavenly. And we find ourselves discovering that we need to believe something a little different we find in scripture that things need to be different Uh, one of the things that was loosed was the dietary restrictions of course the law was given to show us that we were in need of a savior they pointed to the christ the sacrificial system pointed to the christ and there was salvation in that but it was easy in this very heavily physical procedural system to get lost in it and forget that it's not actually the animals that are providing salvation and becomes a muscle memory thing and not a thing of the heart. And those dietary restrictions showed the children of Israel that it was such a mess. But Christ came to not do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. And as we hold ourselves out of the world toward Christ, we accomplish basically the same thing that not intermarrying and not eating certain foods uh, did for the children of Israel. The law is our schoolmaster. And Peter, one of the disciples, was uh, very good about much of this. And it's kind of funny because Peter had a particular problem with this, uh, with eating foods offered to idols and to eating um foods that had been forbidden in the law Um, on a trip to Joppa. um, They stopped and we're going to have a meal. And Peter went up to the roof of the house um, and was just resting and relaxing. I mean, they were, they had a rigorous schedule and much was going on in their lives and the lives of Peter and the disciples um, along with Jesus. And there was stuff going on all the time. And so he needed a break and he had himself a little vision. He said, uh, we find this in Acts chapter 10, 9 through 16. It says, On the morrow as they went on their journey, they drew nigh into the city. And Peter went up onto the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became hungry and would have eaten. But while they were making ready, the food wasn't ready yet. So he went up there and he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending upon him had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. So this great picnic blanket came down wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And these were, uh, you know, pigs, uh, shrimp, all kinds of things. All the things that they, the the, the crustaceans and things they weren't supposed to eat um, were on this picnic blanket. And the voice told him, Hey, go ahead and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common 
or unclean. He had he was a fisherman, and I think he was rough around the edges, but he had not violated those dietary laws. Of course, it may have been very difficult to violate those dietary laws if you lived in a Jewish family. So even the faithfulness of those you lived with could keep you out of trouble to a certain amount. But he says, I haven't done this. I've never done that. And the voice spoke unto him again a second time, what God hath cleansed that call not common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again unto heaven. It, it, God cleansed that thing. Christ cleanses things. It, that grace that comes through Christ cleanses things and can make them okay. Does that make sense? Um, and so Peter was urged through this vision that he had in this trance to understand that these dietary laws are being superseded. And that it is okay. So this thing that was bound up is being loosed. And that's the reason we need to keep our feet moving and be able to move around. Peter had to keep his feet moving and be able to move around. He also struggled with the what the Judaizers would believe, that people had to go through the Jewish tradition to become a Christian. And Paul had to straighten him out on that. And, and you know, he was wrong for a little while, but he got it right. And that's why we... Uh, extend grace to people to allow them to get right. But we also want to urge them toward rightness. We don't need to stand by silently and watch them fail, but we need to urge you with a loving and understanding heart to help them toward what is right. And um, one of the issues that many people will talk about these doubtful disputations, these doubtful things. One of the main issues that seems to be the topic that's being addressed in this manner is that of alcohol. Proverbs 21 says, wine, a mo- wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That seems pretty clear to me. But people want to talk about that like it's doubtful. Um, we know that in Jesus' time and in third world countries, it's much safer to uh, drink a fermented juice than it is to drink the water. Um, Dysentery can come from dirty water, and many people, most people, seem to die um, of dysentery or something else that takes them as they're weakened from a disease. Um, Very often, it's not the disease that kills you. Just like cancer doesn't uh, kill a lot of people, cancer weakens them or takes them down, and the flu will take them, or a cold or uh, pneumonia. These things will come get them because of their weakened state is like a wildebeest who in his old age uh he doesn't die of old age but it's his old age that gets him killed uh, and so the same kind of thing happens with us and uh wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging uh, they m- had to drink wine back then we do not they drank unmixed wine they didn't add sugar to it the alcohol that is in wine That fermentation process is brought about by microorganisms that consume the sugars and produce alcohol. They're basically, that's their waste product. So we're, uh, alcohol is the drinking of the sewer of microorganisms. If that, I hope that becomes unappetizing to you. If drink is the thing that you want, I think scripture makes it very clear. And and I'll share a little bit more with that in a little bit. But uh, that's one thing that was kind of loose, but it has become bound to a great degree. And you may debate me on that, but you would be wrong. (laughs) There you go. I said it and I'm prepared to stand by it. So there we have it. So, but we need to be okay by making sure that we're not harshly judging those around us. And then of course we need to allow them to be okay. Let us not therefore in verse 13, judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I may not agree with you. You may not agree with me, but I don't want to make you stumble. I don't want to harm you. I don't want to wish ill on you. I want to allow you to do well. And if what I'm doing bothers you, then I need to be prepared to not do it. I think of an example. Um, I don't smoke and I don't think we should smoke as Christians, but back in the day when uh, America was a free country, And people could smoke in a restaurant or smoke in a building or smoke in a house or whatever. Um, It was a common practice when you were sitting near someone or you're, you were in close proximity to someone to say, do you mind if I smoke? And that before they would light up and smoke to be 
careful to not be offensive or bother a botheration to the person that you're with. That is just good common sense. And that is the kind of thinking that we need to have amongst the brethren. We need to say, well, I may have the freedom to do this thing, but I need to make sure I'm not harming my brother or bothering my brother, becoming a stumbling block or an occasion for him to fall into temptation because of the way that I live. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Paul said all things are lawful, but he also said not all things are expedient. So there is nothing unclean unto itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with your meat, now walkest thou not charitably. If you're stepping outside the bounds, if you're harming your brother, if you're offending your brother with your liberty. So just don't destroy him with your meat offered to idols. Don't destroy him with your doubtful thing, in quotation marks. Um, let not then your good be evil spoken of. And those that use doubtful things to justify their use of alcohol will very often say, this is a doubtful thing, so you cannot condemn what I'm doing. But what they're not understanding is what Paul is telling us here. It's He's not saying, don't be bothered by these things. He's saying, if someone's bothered, don't do it. So those that would label drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes or using coarse language, if they would label those as a doubtful thing, they need to be regarding their weaker brethren. I will be your weaker brother because I am. I'm bothered by these things. And I think scripture is pretty clear on them. I don't think they're doubtful things at all. But if it be a doubtful thing, we need to abstain from that behavior for the sake of our brothers. So that doubtful disputations passage, this whole section of scripture is not the excuse to do the thing, but it's our admonition to not do it for the sake of our brothers. Verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything unclean, to him it is unclean. But if your brother be grieved, then you're walking uncharitably. So let not your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We don't need to be looking to these things. We don't need to be taking care of ourselves, looking out for, quote, number one, end quote. We need to be looking out for the Lord and for our brethren, living a life of joy through the Holy Spirit. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. So let us do pursue those things that are about peace and things wherewith one may edify another. It does not edify the brethren, Lord, uh, uh, folks, if uh, in a church some think it's okay for me to drink and others think, no, it's not okay. Um, I've already made pretty clear my stand on that. But if there is a dispute and some say no and some say yes, the answer needs to be no. The answer needs to be no. And I wish I could get on to uh, social media is not a great big room where everybody can hear at once as we might be deceived to think. But if I could, I would get get on the PA and and in this big room that is social media, I would say, hey, Christians, hey, you call yourselves Christians. Stop posting pictures of you drinking. Stop posting pictures of your alcohol, because there are those who will be caused to stumble by this. And I can tell you hundreds of stories about how alcohol hurts mankind and society and families and lives. And you can't tell me one where it's enhanced other than uh, satisfying some fleshly desire to be worldly and sophisticated or to get a little buzz and escape from whatever reality it is you're trying to escape from. Um, I don't know how much of your mind some say, well, the Bible says don't to drink unto drunkenness. Um, well, how much of your mind is it okay to give away to a chemical and surrender it to that rather than surrendering to God? I'd rather surrender my mind and my heart to the Lord. For he that in, in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. We need to edify one another. We need to not be offensive to our brothers. We need to not do things that will be offensive to them and to cause them to stumble. 
Mark 9, 42 says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believeth in me, it is better for him that a millstone be hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. That's a scary picture, isn't it? Can you imagine a, a millstone? Or You may not imagine a millstone at all. Um, imagine a boat anchor tied around your neck, and you were taken out into the ocean and thrown in. It will pull you down. And that, what a scary thought. Um, but it would be better for that to happen to you than that you cause offense to one of God's little ones. That should be a sober warning to us. That should get our attention and make us decide we don't want to be found guilty of doing this thing. In Luke 17, 1, it says, Then said he unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. People are going to be offended. Believers are going to be offended. But woe unto him through whom they come. Don't you be the one that causes offense. God will take care of those of his children that are offended. But don't you be the one that's doing the offending. Don't mess with God. Um, as a lost child, I accepted Christ at the age of 13. But much younger than that, I was given to shoplifting and other theft um, and vandalism and destruction um, I was a little jerk and a horrible little boy, not because of my mother's raising, but in spite of it, but, uh, between Jesus and my mother, I was rescued from that. But one thing I ha I knew, and as a lost child, I just understood this thing. Um, I did not mind stealing from people. I did not, not mind destroying their stuff. But one thing I did not want to do was vandalize or steal from a church because I thought to myself, I don't want to mess with God if there is one. I don't want to mess with God. And we don't need to be found guilty of causing offense to our brethren. Woe unto him that would do this thing. We don't want to be caught doing it. So all we do, all that we are needs to be on the foundation of, of Jesus Christ and how we build on that foundation is everything. And if we're uh, bringing offense to our brethren, we're not building well on that foundation. Um, you know, if you're building with gold and silver and precious stones, you're building well, but if you're doing wood, hay and stubble, those will be burned up. Now this is not going to cause you to be lost, but it's important that we not waste a lot of energy and time building poorly on that foundation. And certainly what we don't need to do is build upon that foundation, a structure that is offensive to the brethren. We don't want to take them down with our liberties. So don't for the meat offered idols destroy what God is doing in someone else's life. We need to not be offensive in our liberties. So it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor any other thing whereby that brother stumbles. And you don't need to do it if it's going to cause your brother to stumble. Let me say that again. You don't need to do it if it causes your brother to stumble. Oh, my. How, how have we lost track of this? How have we missed the boat on this little piece of information? And in case you have doubts about, well, you already know how I feel about alcohol. Here are some verses. It's pretty clear that alcohol is damaging. And I don't know why, given all this scripture and given all we know about alcohol, that you would think alcohol would be a good idea. Um, there you go. If you find my preaching on drinking offensive, I apologize only a little bit. We'll press on. So I'm okay. You're okay. Now we need to be okay. We're okay. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. Because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not faith is sin. And so we want to be okay by not being offensive. We don't want to be careful for our brothers to not offend them. And we need to make sure that we're uh, all doing right together. Uh, I think it's important to understand that it's not enough to say, I'm okay with this, I'm going to do this. That does not give us permission to do it. Because if we're not actually okay with it, I mean, how many, how many Christians, you know, uh, let me, let me kind of back up here a sec. I spoke about people posting on social media, showing their drinking alcohol and having a good time with their friends. That's fine. Have a good time. But very often they will promote the alcohol in an attempt to justify and say, it's okay. 
It's okay if I do this thing. Have you ever known someone on a diet? They'll rationalize that donut or that whatever it is they're eating. I've done it. I, I struggle with food. I understand. I get it. But I also know what it is to be feeling the guilt of this is a wrong thing to do, but doing it anyway and attempting to rationalize it in the eyes of those who behold me at the moment. Um, we do this because we know we're wrong. And saying you're okay with it doesn't make it okay. You you can fool me. Yeah, fooling me is not a hard thing. You can fool me easier than you fool anybody. And you may even be able to fool yourself, but what you need to understand is you're not responsible to make me happy with it. You're not responsible to make yourself happy with it. You're responsible to make God happy with it. You need to be responsive to God. If the Spirit leads you to not, then don't. If the Spirit allows you to do, then do. But do not make it an occasion for your brother to stumble. And living in America and knowing what we know about God, um, I don't think anybody, even lost people, are excused from understanding how God would have us behave in certain matters. And for you to pretend that God's okay with it, that you have some license from the Spirit when you know that you don't, does not excuse you. Um, I think it makes you doubly damned indeed. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not faith is sin. Let's don't go down this road. Let's protect one another. When in doubt, don't do it. Um, if you've been involved in any kind of industry in America, if you do any job that is somewhat dangerous, you've heard of OSHA, you've heard of MSHA, you've heard of all these organizations that work hard for safety. And the uh, crux of the matter of safety is this. If it's dangerous, don't do it. If you have to do it, do it safely. If there's potential for harm, protect yourself from it. You um, wear a face shield when, when working with certain tools so that you don't get debris in your face or what have you. You wear a seatbelt when you drive. You avoid doing this, that, or the other thing for your safety. Well, we as Christians, we as the church, we as people of God need to uh, have a mindset that has us if it's dangerous, don't do it. If it causes your brother to stumble, don't do it. If it's going to cause a problem within the church, just don't do it. It's not about you. It's about us. And us should be about Jesus. So there's no room for a selfish, let my brother rot, I want to do this thing kind of an attitude. We need to make sure that we're okay and that we're serving the Lord as we ought. So we need to make sure that we're not, we're not the ones manipulating and working the system or uh, attempting to and trying to convince people that um, what we're doing is right. If you've gone after and found proof text to say, this is okay for me to do, that you pulled the doubtful, uh, uh, played the doubtful disputations card and said, it's okay for me to do this thing and, and my brethren need to just deal with it. You put yourself at risk and if you put yourself in a position as a teacher, you put yourself at further risk. Uh, James 3, 1 says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. If you decide you're going to be the master and you're going to teach Scripture, and that goes on me too, as I've been teaching you here today, if I would tempt, attempt to manipulate Scripture to satisfy my druthers, to satisfy my particular penchant or bent, um, then... I need to be careful because I'm, I'm going to have to answer to my Lord. And there are those that say, well, don't you worry about it. I'll, you know, God looks on the heart. Well, that shouldn't be a comfort to us, brethren. I don't know anybody's heart that is uh, totally right before the Lord. So l we're not going to find much uh, comfort or safety there. But if we put ourselves in the position of teacher, there is, therefore, uh, a greater condemnation to us if we are doing it wrongly. So we don't want to be caught manipulating it. Um, and we also don't want to fail to teach where we should. Um, we don't want to omit helpfulness to our brethren and teaching to our brethren. Um, Ezekiel 33, 6 says, But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. God, nothing will come into anybody's life that God hasn't ordained 
But if your inactions contribute to it, you will be required to answer for that to the Lord. That blood he will require of the watchman's hand. So we should not manipulate scripture and try to force people into what we want to believe. But we do need to teach the truth. We do need to teach the truth as far as we understand. And then as we meet together as brethren, we need to find that ground where no man, no man is caused to stumble. And then, of course, we just need to be faithful, faithful in our walk, faithful to the Lord, um, and not be about us and our fleshly desires. First Corinthians 4, 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. We don't just decide, okay, I'm a Christian now. I'm part of the club. Yay. I like singing the songs, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to go on and live my life like I want to. No, we need to be faithful to the Lord. We have a job to do. We are still on earth because there's work for us to do. It's not a one and done. I don't have to do anything else about it kind of a thing. It's a call. It's a sacrifice. It's a lifestyle. It's a purpose for living and a purpose for for behaving. Second Corinthians 5 10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Some things are good. Some things are bad, but it's always going to be bad if we're causing the brethren to stumble. Now you may disagree with some of the things I've taught here. Um, and we can deal with that. You can communicate that with me. But what we need to understand is we don't need to cause the brethren to stumble because we want to give ourselves permission to something. Let us not cause the brethren to stumble. Let us care about one another as much as the Lord cares for us. He gave his only begotten son. You can give up a certain licensed thing for the sake of your brother, can you not? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for Paul's admonitions to us to care for one another in our behaviors. Now, Lord, help us to understand our responsibility to our brethren. Help us to take seriously the potential for harm we can do to them by taking license, by being thoughtless toward them. Lord, help us to be believers who care about believers. Help us to care about one another, to exercise love and forgiveness and thoughtfulness within the body. Help us to reflect your love by the way we love one another that all men will know that we're your disciples because we have love one to another. Now, Lord, as we work on being strengthened in this regard, help us to go forward with a love for the lost world as well, to share with them the love that you have, that you've demonstrated through your son. Help us to be lively ambassadors of your love to this lost and dying world. We thank you, Lord, and we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So love the brethren. Brethren, care for one another. Love one another more than we love ourselves. Let us reflect on this. Let us reflect on God's word and let that word be reflected to our brethren. So join us again as we continue to reflect on his word. Bye now.